The bright lights of the casino flash around Jamie's aching head, his eyes still swollen and purple from a recent assault. He's surrounded by drunk people, laughing, cheering at his amazing fortune, his unbelievable luck. As he cries into his glass of whiskey, he swears to God he's been cursed. A hand touches him on his shoulder. Oh God, not him again. Being mega wealthy is not easy in the least. If you've talked to Jamie weeks earlier, you'd have heard nothing but complaining. He was broke, and he'd just been dumped by his longtime girlfriend, Anna. You have zero ambition. You're a bottom feeder, she said right before she left the apartment, taking the cat he'd bought for her birthday with her. During the lockdowns, Jamie had been employed by Detroit Parks and Rec, with the promise that if he worked hard, they'd pay him to get on the certificate program and basically pick up litter. He was thinking as he was reminded about the program one time, he'd just gotten in trouble for not wearing his mask for a minute. He was fired soon after for the same offense. Then it happened. He was standing in the street one day with all his things after being evicted from his apartment when some guy in a suit and a bowler hat approached him. In a British accent, the guy said, Money troubles, young man? Jamie just thought he was some kind of eccentric pervert. Jamie was broke, but his body was not for sale. The guy said, What if I told you at this very moment, your bank account is $1 billion in the positive? Yeah, right, thought Jamie. And I'm Mother Teresa's long lost son. The guy looked at him seriously. Listen here, he said, and he explained that the money is his, but the catch is he has to spend it all in one month. He can keep whatever he buys and he can do anything he wants with the stuff after the month is up. The game ends at midnight exactly on one month from today. The catch was every penny must be spent. Jamie was told he couldn't give any of it away. He couldn't buy anyone gifts. He must pay reasonable prices for the things he buys. He can't just invest it in stocks and bonds. He has to buy things he can use personally or consume personally and he can't tell anyone about how he got the money. Enjoy your newfound wealth, young man, said the guy, doffing his hat and walking away, his walking stick twirling in the air. Jamie checked his account at an ATM, knowing full well the depressing digital numbers on the screen would read 56 cents, the amount his ex reminded him about before she walked out. He almost fainted when he saw it. One, followed by nine zeros, and then 56 cents. This can't be real, he thought. Just to make sure it wasn't a joke, he pressed the button for withdrawal. Sure enough, $100 slid out. The screen read, your remaining balance is $999,999,900. He looked up into the cloudy sky and could swear he saw fluffy letters, WTF. He looked around to see if he was being filmed. Was this a setup, a prank? He walked right across the street and was about to hand his cash to a homeless guy when he remembered the British guy's words. You cannot give any of it away, dear boy, you have to purchase things. He thought about just asking the homeless guy to sell him his shoes for a hundred bucks, but then he realized hundred bucks for a tatty pair of Reeboks is hardly a reasonable price. So he went to the nearest store he could find, a kind of hobby store, and bought a miniature model of Detroit's famed Penobscot building. The thing was really detailed and had metal and glass all through its tiny structure, but at 85 bucks, well, Jamie could think of better things to spend the money on. Just the other day, he couldn't afford a 10-pack of wieners from Walmart. He was a few cents short of the $2.84. He started thinking, 28 cents per hot dog. He looked at his recent acquisition in his hand. Damn, he thought, that's about 300 hot dogs. He's going to have to think much bigger than wieners. He was going to spend his money. Just to check that it was real again, he went back to draw out more money. He did wonder something. He'd heard that banks often will close their accounts if loads of cash suddenly appear in it. They call it suspicious activity. Maybe they think you're money laundering. Jamie had read it happening to a guy who'd gotten rich suddenly from crypto. Oh well, maybe the English dude had pulled some strings. He then went inside the bank, thinking this would be risky. It wasn't at all. Even though Jamie's entire outfit had cost him about 200 wieners, he had to stop thinking in sausage terms, and he asked the teller for $2,000, and she just did it. He then picked up the courage to ask her, what's my daily limit? She replied without so much as looking at him, it's a savings account, sir, there's no limit provided you show government-issued ID for large amounts. He was off like a racehorse. He was going to hit the big time. He started walking to the KFC near the Fisher Building, thinking about buying everything on the menu and then thought, damn, I'm a billionaire, I don't need KFC. Then he remembered that place he'd always walked past on Congress Street, what was it called? Uh, the London Chop House, that was it. After getting in a taxi, he tried to walk in. The place was empty since it was still only the afternoon. He was stopped right in his tracks by some snooty looking kid. Can you read? Said the kid. He pointed to a sign near the door, proper attire required. I'm a billionaire, thought Jamie. And he asked, how much do I have to pay to get a table? The kid just smirked, thinking Jamie didn't have a penny. After all, Jamie was wearing a $20 t-shirt he bought from J. Crew factory that had a dog on the front wearing a baseball cap. Jamie then asked, what's the going rate to get inside without a reservation? What would make you happy? 100 bucks switched hands, and in about 30 minutes, Jamie was looking down at a 14-ounce Imperial Wagyu New York strip. 
with a 2.5 ounce Hudson Valley foie gras side dish nestled among some mushrooms cooked with beurre rouge, garlic, and shallots, his first ever posh meal. When the bill came, it was the most expensive restaurant bill he'd seen in his life so far, almost $220. He felt proud and sick as a dog. That double chocolate dome with berry coulis was probably overkill, and there was no way he was going to finish his second bottle of Pinot Noir. Still, he sat there and forced it down, knowing leaving it might break the rules of the game. He looked in his wallet. It was stacked with bills. He was going to have to think much bigger than this. As he was about to look at his phone for an Uber, he thought, wait a minute, I'm a billionaire. He went back to the restaurant and after having a chat with the owner, who made a few phone calls, Jamie was waiting for his stretch limousine with chauffeur. Not too bad for 1200 bucks per day, chauffeur included. Then he thought, with all this cash, life could get a little dangerous. Detroit is hardly Pleasantville, USA. He started looking online. He could get a fairly cheap bodyguard for about 200 bucks an hour, with the upper price range being about 1000 bucks an hour. He wanted three of them, each working an eight-hour shift. That worked out to 24000 per day or 720000 for the month. It seemed like a lot, he thought, considering Madonna spends just 500000 a year on personal security. Still, maybe he could get in touch with Meghan Markle or Mark Zuckerberg and get their kind of security because they pay something like 15 million to 20 million a year. This still won't get rid of the cash fast enough, and anyway, Jamie needs stuff to sell after he's spent the billion if he's going to remain rich. It would take too long to get Zuckerberg's staff anyway, so he called the local Detroit bodyguard firm, and they agreed on a price of three men for $500 an hour, each working eight-hour shifts to cover 24 hours for the entire month working out to about 360000 for the month for all three guys. The door guy who'd looked down on Jamie a couple of hours ago watched in total disbelief as a stretch limo pulled up and then a bunch of guys in dark glasses appeared. Jamie went to bed that night thinking about the car he was going to buy in the morning. He got up at 7 a.m. without an alarm clock, felt like Christmas when he was a kid. The night shift bodyguard Tom, a talkative guy from Ohio, was just clocking off and the guy they called Bad Barry was coming in. Jamie liked Bad Barry. He didn't ask questions. In fact, he was almost totally silent, which Jamie needed if he was going to get through all this money without any fuss. It was a Tuesday. Jamie wanted a car. He really wanted a Bugatti, but Detroit didn't have a dealership, and Jamie wanted a car that morning. He had good reason for that. He headed to suburban exotic motor cars of Michigan in Troy. He was in luck because they had a car he wanted, a McLaren 720S Spider 2023 going for just $394,010. Walking in there from a limo and having a bodyguard next to Jamie got him the royal treatment straight away. This was a guy who a year earlier had been picking up used condoms and cigarette butts. He was about to purchase a car that does 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds and has a top speed of 212 miles per hour. As he handed over his credit card after calling the bank, the dealership guy did a double take when he saw Jamie's Rick and Morty wristwatch bought in a thrift store for the princely sum of 8 bucks. After a month or two, it got stuck at 2.36 a.m., but Jamie liked the way it looked. After he left the garage, the dealer called his wife and said, I just had one of those scruffy tech guys in here buying a McLaren. Jamie was followed by the limo and Bad Barry. He told them to meet him outside a large baking company where his ex did 12-hour shifts as a wrapping machine operator. Jamie knew in her hour off she always went out for a smoke in the nearby park. As she walked out, her hairnet still on, Jamie honked at her from his McLaren. As they'd been told, both the chauffeur and bodyguard also gave her a kind of salute. No sooner than she could think, Jamie hit the pedal and sped off, the words bottom feeder making him smile. Still, he wanted two cars. That was reasonable for one person, he thought. He wanted a Bugatti, and the Bugatti dealer was far away. Jamie got Bad Barry, also now acting as a PA, to arrange a flight to the Bugatti dealership at Newport Beach in California. It was too damn cold in Detroit anyway. The charter service wanted $52,000 for the aircraft, but as he was taking his three bodyguards as well as his chauffeur, and there were tons of add-ons, the flight was closer to $70,000 for them all. $140,000 return. Not bad, thought Jamie. Not enough if he wanted to get through this cash in a month. When they got to the showroom, there wasn't even the Bugatti he wanted for sale. The Chiron Supersport 300 Plus at $3.9 million. The dealer sounded really condescending when he informed Jamie that these cars aren't like buying shoes, you have to order them. Jamie was outraged. He even shouted at the manager, I'll never come back here again. A day with the money and he was already turning into a prize a-hole. There was only one thing to do for a man in such an imperious mood, and that was to head to Beverly Hills. But not before he went to a private dealer in downtown LA and picked up a 2018 Chiron for $3.6 million. Jamie said he'd drive it back to Detroit when he had the time. He'd still only spent about $5 million. That was nothing, really, for a billionaire. Thankfully, the 5,000-square-foot presidential suite at the Mayborn Beverly Hills Hotel was empty, so he booked that at $30,000 a night. 
he literally couldn't find a more expensive room in LA. Jamie had the idea to have a party and maybe invite some folks who could teach him how to spend money. He'd heard in the past that Elon Musk had a place in Bel Air, but it seems he now spends most of his time in Austin. Zuckerberg was likely in California, but Jamie wanted a party, not a night of computing pie. Anyway, even when you're a billionaire, how do you suddenly make rich friends? Maybe buying a nice house was the answer. Near some Hollywood stars, actors, now they like to party. The phone rang. When Jamie picked it up, it was the British guy. You can buy one house only, dear boy. These things are for you and you only, and no one needs more than one house. And he hung up. Damn. Jamie looked out the window to see if any surveillance pigeons were around. When he was looking for houses, the first thing he thought was that there are some really cheap skates in Beverly Hills living in $1 million houses, but he found an 11-bedroom, 16-bath place on Benedict Canyon Drive he could certainly live in for a while. $85 million. Not bad at all. The most expensive he could find that day. He felt like celebrating and buying some extremely expensive wine, but the most expensive stuff was only available at auction. Still, he managed to find a place in LA that stocked some Screaming Eagle Cabernet Sauvignon, Napa Valley, going at $3,567 a bottle. He bought 12, knowing the rules dictated he couldn't just give them all away. 12 he could manage alone, but now the bodyguards were looking at him funny, kind of resentful. Except for Bad Barry. Bad Barry was alright. Jamie was already starting to feel depressed for some reason. There was something off-putting about being able to buy what you wanted. Jamie had a great idea, something just right for his rotten mood. Soon, the singer Morrissey, a long-term resident of LA, was on his way to Jamie's hotel room. Morrissey said he usually charged $500,000 for a personal gig, but he'd do it for $300,000 as times were hard. He was having issues with his new record. Justin Bieber cost a million for a private gig, but, well, it's Justin Bieber. Jamie had standards. Even if he was trying to get rid of his money, Morrissey turned up and did three songs from his set list of eight. Halfway through, heaven knows I'm miserable now, Morrissey said he'd come down with a sudden cold. Still, the next night Jamie got Rihanna for $8 million since she was already in LA. He spent the next 10 days mostly alone in his suite, nursing hangovers, now bored of seemingly everything he could think of. He thought about that time he and Anna were bored and broke and they made booby-shaped cookies together. He never laughed so hard after she got mad at him for making triple D sizes. To fill the void of existential despair, Jamie did what any rich person would do and bought a yacht. He searched all day looking for ones he could buy right now, not order for later, and found a beauty named the Victorious. It was a steal at 115 million euros after the price was recently reduced by about $18 million. It had its own helicopter, a cinema, loads of rooms for the buddies Jamie had not called since he got his billion, and of course a swimming pool and a beauty salon. He spent the next few days trying to invite celebrities to his party but kept getting fobbed off by their agents. He thought about buying a kilo of coke. Morrissey had given him the number of a guy in Malibu. He could get a kilo for $32,000 and maybe he could invite Macaulay Culkin over. Then he realized that would effectively be giving stuff away and anyway, Google search revealed Culkin had gone straight. Jamie already had a helicopter, so there was no need for another, but what he didn't have was a plane. Why hire a charter when he can have his own and pay for a crew? The most convenient plane to buy right away was a Gulfstream 800 which he got for a bargain at $72.5 million. One thing he learned pretty damn quickly though was the overheads on planes were utterly ridiculous. It was like going to see a movie and having to buy the theater. With fuel costs, maintenance, taxis, deliveries, insurance, and getting a crew for a month, he was looking at $100 million. No wonder Bill Gates wanted to go carbon free. Still, it was good news for Jamie who was now well into his billion after 15 days. Then it was as if a light went on in his head. How had he not thought of this earlier? He could hire a private army, a bunch of hardcore ex-Special Forces mercenaries. He'd read that back in the day the Libyan regime was paying West African fighters $2,000 a day. What if you wanted ex-SAS, Delta Force, Green Berets? The more Jamie read about this, the more he realized it wasn't going to happen, not in the US anyway and it would take too long to go over to a military dictatorship and find the right men. He saw that you could hire private security with military experience, but he kinda had that with his bodyguards, they were all ex-military. Then he had another idea. He could reasonably hire more of these people if he owned a private island. He wanted something close to home, it'd be easier to get there if he couldn't sell it on later, and he just didn't trust the authorities in far off lands. So he picked up a lovely little place, 80 acres, called Gunpoint Island in the Bahamas. Only $23 million and it had a house and tennis court on it, so obviously some infrastructure if he were ever to return after winning the game. Jamie then hired three private security contractors for $800 an hour and flew them all there on his private jet. And that's when Jamie realized something, he didn't own a watch. Well, not one that worked. Looking around the internet, there were a bunch of expensive ones, but again, 
Some of them weren't easy to buy outright, you had to wait, but for 31 million, he soon got his hands on a Patek Philippe Grandmaster chime. He had to be honest though, when he put it on, he kind of missed his Rick and Morty watch. This spending malarkey was much harder than he thought. He wondered about buying a rocket for space travel. No, said the British guy, you can't use it. What about a weapon? asked Jamie. Like an F-35 or a nuclear sub? The British guy asked, is that legal, old boy? Damn. In all the small businesses he was looking at, most of them weren't worth much at all. Over and over in his head, he was thinking, how do you waste loads of money? How do you go totally broke really fast? And then it hit him like a flash of lightning. Hi, is that Disney Plus? Jamie asked the guy on the phone. I'm calling to inquire if you have any business opportunities you can recommend I get involved with. Jamie was told Disney wanted hundreds of millions for an exciting new TV series that had been pitched to them, a potential multi-season gritty drama featuring a human version of Bob the Builder going over to the US and opening a burger stand in a neighborhood controlled by MS-13. It's like Breaking Bad meets Thomas the Tank Engine, says the guy. Good luck, said Jamie hanging up the phone. He remembered he wasn't allowed to invest money. If Disney couldn't help him waste his money, who could? Jamie spent another two days drinking wine and ordering pizza just because he now knew it didn't matter how expensive the food was that he bought, it was never enough in the bigger scheme of things. On this night, his new friend was staying over, Jolene, or at least that's what she said she was named. He'd met her the other night at a hostess bar in West Hollywood. She saw him spend loads of cash on himself, but man, was he stingy. He didn't buy anyone drinks and only left a standard tip. In the presidential suite, they were watching Bling Empire when Jolene said, can you imagine owning a place like this? No sooner than she said that, Jamie got on the phone and put his new house on the market for a low price. He knew the call would be coming. The British guy told him that he could sell stuff, but the money he loses goes back into his account. Fair enough, thought Jamie, he had a plan. He'd done some Google searching before this. A massive hotel in Las Vegas called the Cosmopolitan had just sold for $5.65 billion, with a casino inside though. So why not buy a hotel? Jamie didn't even need to run it, he could just live there. Then he saw the Amman Hotel at 57th Street and 5th Avenue in Manhattan. It was going for $600 million, the most expensive hotel in New York. The group that owned it must have thought he was crazy when Jamie said he'd pay now. He didn't even need to look at it or have a meeting. He'd get his PA, still bad Barry, to get the paperwork done and that was that. Deal done. But this all took a few days. By the time Jamie was a hotel owner, he had one day left to spend the rest of his cash. He bought all kinds of things in the meantime. A Wittelsbach Graf diamond ring, 80 million. A British guy said no more jewels or jewelry. He got his hands on Andy Warhol's dollar sign painting for half a million just because he thought it was apt. He was in the middle of bidding on a much more expensive painting when weirdly the auctioneer stopped mid-bid and told Jamie that buying another masterpiece was breaking the rules. He then paid 22 million for a thoroughbred racehorse, but all these acquisitions were really time consuming. There was so much red tape, so much faffing around. Spending a billion was harder than he ever imagined. Jolene had watched him spend this money absolutely amazed. Obviously, Jamie wasn't allowed to tell her what was happening. She just thought he was some eccentric multi-billionaire who liked to waste money. When Jamie told her he was going to take his private jet to Las Vegas and she could come, she was over the moon. She had bought the pizza that night. He later told her that he couldn't bankroll her Vegas trip. He wouldn't even pay her taxi fare that night, and she'd spent all her money on the pizza. She punched him right in the face, which immediately blackened his eye. He had half a day to spend $13 million. Simple. Gamble it. House always wins. He could have gone and bought something, but he wanted to go out in style. He could have gambled all month, of course, but what would he have left when he won the game? Nothing. When he made the decision to go to Vegas, he looked at his phone. It didn't ring. He was good to go. He had Bad Barry and Jolene, now not so upset, and they all went in the private jet. By this time, Jamie had fired the other two bodyguards and was paying Bad Barry their wages. The other two kept asking questions. It got annoying. Some of the worst odds in the casino are the slots. And as luck would have it, Jamie found one in the Cosmopolitan which had $5,000 spins. The problem was, as per Nevada gaming law, the machines had a payout ratio of about 75%, and it seemed the one Jamie just went on had taken a huge chunk of cash from people before he got there because he couldn't stop winning. Time was ticking too. It could take a long, long time before he lost all his money. He won the jackpot on a $1,000 spin machine. When he looked upset, he shouted, crap! and then someone took offense. A bad loser. He started screaming at Jamie and threw a punch only for Bad Barry to catch his hand and break his arm in one move. He spent a few precious hours on various slots, and instead of losing his 13 million at 10 p.m. two hours before cutoff time, he had 15.7 million. He'd been running around like crazy, playing various games all at once, all at the highest stakes. His uncanny luck was now drawing crowds around him. He could, of course, play the game with the best winning odds, blackjack, and keep asking for another card so he'd go bust. 
But as soon as that thought went through his mind, the British guy was tapping on his shoulder saying that's tantamount to throwing money away. He was allowed to twist on 20 and under, but when he played, he somehow kept getting perfect cards. Plus, the bet limits were only 50,000. He bet that lots of time, and by God, he was dealt 21 a lot. Now, with only an hour to go and about 10 gin and tonics in, Jamie headed over to the roulette table. Also, really bad odds for gamblers in Vegas, with a 5.26% house edge. Keno was even worse, but the bets were small, and Jamie wasn't familiar with the game. Jamie knew that roulette players quite often bet as high as 10,000 on a single number. But he also heard about that British guy who sold his house and car in England and went straight to Vegas to bet $135,300 on a single spin. He won $270,600 and didn't make another bet. Seems the biggest bet ever on roulette in a single spin was $250,000. They put it on black and it came up red. And that was exactly what Jamie needed. The casino wouldn't allow Jamie to put all his millions on one color, one group of numbers, or a number. But they would let him throw down 100000 at a time. Thank God, because he kept putting that amount on one number with 35 to 1 odds, and he kept losing. As people groaned around him, he and Bad Barry were now jumping for joy. Bad Barry had no idea why, he just knew Jamie liked losing, so he went along with it. At 11.33 p.m., Jamie was down to 7 million in a bit. The money was going fast, although he made the mistake of putting all his bets over the board at time and actually winning some money. Then his actual number came in, black 13 on a $100,000 bet, and he couldn't believe it. He couldn't seem to lose. Now he had 10.5 million. He couldn't get the guy to spin faster either. People got annoyed when Jamie tried to rush them, but soon settled down when Bad Barry gave them a certain look. Barry, who barely ever said a word, whispered in Jamie's ear. He said, If you're actually trying to lose, you do know Floyd Mayweather once bet 5.9 million on the Miami Heat winning. Then Jamie remembered back in 2018 when that guy in Vegas bet 3.5 million on the Philadelphia Eagles to win, and they won. It was now 11.59 and Jamie had 8 million. There was no conceivable one-minute bet, though. Unbelievable, he lost everything. The island, the yacht, the hotel, the watch. And then he felt a tap on his shoulder. It was the British guy. You win, said Jamie, almost glad the game was finally over. Out of nowhere came a Texan guy wearing a Stetson. He walked up to Jamie and said, I'll bet you everything you have on the table on the flip of this coin. You want to lose so badly. The Texan had a 24 karat gold dime in between his thumb and forefinger. Jamie remembered a media mogul in Australia had had a similar experience in Vegas with a hundred million. Go for it, Jamie said. Heads. Jolene, real name Sarah, is sitting with Jamie at their house on Gunpoint Island, looking over the Atlantic Ocean as the sun slowly dips below the horizon. They hear a scream in the distance. Damn it! It's Bad Barry on the tennis court. He just snapped another racket. We should get him a dog, says Sarah, gripping Jamie's hand. Just below his Rick and Morty watch that still reads 2.36 a.m. Who needs time anyway? Now you need to watch why you don't want to make more than $75,000 or learn how kings and queens make money and how the British royals actually make money.